Good evening. I'd like to call to order the uh, May 15th City of Urbana City Council Committee of the Whole. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Here. Mr. Evans? Here. Ms. Hersey? Here. Ms. Colasetti? Here. Ms. Bishop? Here. Ms. Wilkin? Here. Mr. Quisenberry? Here. Mayor Marlin? Here. Um, before we get started, we just want to um, provide a warm welcome to our colleague, James Quisenberry. Uh, good to see you back in action, sir. And uh, the next item is additions to the agenda. Does anybody have an addition to the agenda? Seen, <laughs> there better not be. Right? <laughs> um, seeing none, we'll go on to presentations and public input. That's a point of order. Do you say that there actually are no minutes for tonight? I just don't know if we need to state that. Do I need to? You can state that. Oh. There are no minutes. Okay. Um, uh, no additions to the agenda. We're going to go to presentations and public input. I'm going to ask the public to be patient, and we'll start with uh, Examiner Banna, the housing chapter with Nick Olson. And this will be our, I believe, the last installment of the Examiner Banna introduction. And you have the floor. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited about this project and to be talking with it, and talking for, about it with you all. And for everybody at home, if you'd like to look at Examine Urbana, it's at examine.urbanaillinois.us. He's got it up on the screen. So thank you. Um, yeah, so we're presenting the housing chapter tonight, um, 10 minutes only leaves time for an overview and a few highlights, so I'll try to hit those and maybe gesture towards some of the areas we're not going to touch as much. Um, I'm also just gonna present this as a slide deck because while the website is great, it's also very big and trying to scroll back and forth between the different sections could get a bit, a bit unwieldy. Um, but we do have the website URL here and we definitely encourage folks to visit it and explore. Um, so with this chapter, we were trying to answer some pretty big questions related to what the housing market looks like in Urbana, how we got where we are, um, what some of the big areas of need are, um, the work we're currently doing to address some of those issues, and where we're heading as we look towards the future. To organize our approach to answering those questions, we separated this story map into four broad categories, each of which contains various subtopics. Um, those larger sections, as you can see, kind of on the top toolbar on this image are history, today's Urbana, what we do, and future considerations. And I'll just briefly go through a general idea of what each of those sections contain. Um, so the history section um, looks at different kinds of housing development in Urbana over the years. Um, from development booms around the railroads and the university in the 19th century, um, through post-war housing booms and subdivision expansion, um, usually through FHA-backed loans. Um, in looking at those things, we also found inevitably that that also led to looking at historic discrimination in the housing market. Um, to touch briefly on that, um, up through the mid 20th century, um, there's a lot of documentation we looked at showing that discrimination ranging from banks to landlords to realtors and property deed restrictions basically limited housing options for local black households to the north side of the Champaign-Urbana area. Um, at the time, this was often outside of out city limits, so this would be in often makeshift structures which lacked basic utilities and other infrastructure, one of which we have an image of here um, from the Museum of the Grand Prairie. Um, we felt it was essential to touch on this history, um, both as an acknowledgement of what was done historically, um, but also because the impacts of this historic discrimination very much continue to be felt in the housing market today. Um, that brings us to the today's Urbana section, um, which offers some snapshot details of what the housing market looks like in Urbana right now and what some of the big areas of need are. It's not totally exhaustive, but we do link to a lot of other sources throughout if folks want to dive deeper on any particular topic. 
Um, on that note, and as we head into the what we do section, um, I just want to mention that while well, it was either myself or Lily doing most of the typing or graphics for this, um, this involved a lot of poking of other people, um, both internally in our grants division, as well as other organizations throughout the city. As I'm sure you all know, housing work is something that gets done by a lot of people working in coordination. So just a shout out and thank you to everyone there. Um, and a lot of those organizations are listed on this slide. Um, and that's really what we're looking at at the What We Do section, which is generally an overview of the work in housing that the city and our community partners do. Um, and again, a lot of those organizations are listed here. And then we close things out with the future considerations section, which just kind of ends with some, some of the big questions and takeaways regarding housing and the comp plan moving forward. So that's a general overview. Um, I think what it makes sense to do with the time we have left um, is to go back to the sort of market snapshot in the Today's Urbana section, dive a bit deeper into some of the major takeaways from that, and then wrap up by pointing to how that all ties into what we look at in the other sections. So a few basic takeaways. Um, we have data showing that a majority, or about two thirds of Urbana households rent um, we also have some data related to what uh, HUD defines as housing problems. Um, and these include cost burden, which HUD defines as paying more than 30% of a household's income on housing expenses, overcrowding, uh, plumbing issues, and so on. Uh, the most commonly experienced of these locally is cost burden. Um, overall, about 40% of households in Urbana have at least one housing problem. Um, but you can also see that that number is mostly made up of renter households. Um, related to this, looking at just cost burden, again, about 40% or four in 10 households overall are cost burdened, um, but among renters, it's actually closer to half. Um, we also know from the data that housing type varies by demographic group. So when renters in particular are more likely to experience these housing issues, and we also know that different demographic groups are more likely to rent, that impact is being disproportionately felt. Um, so as you can see from this graphic, um, local African American households predominantly rent, um, or as local white households are much more likely to be owner occupied. Um, to call back to the history section and some of the story behind this, um, we already touched on some of the history of discrimination that excluded black households from home ownership for a long time, as well as even renting in most parts of town. Um, and this in turn produced segregation at the neighborhood level, um, as well as a wealth gap as white households were able to establish equity, um, which black households were traditionally excluded from for a long time. Um, and then this was passed down through generations, which is a big part in why we still have a wealth gap today. Um, this ties into some things we look at in the what we do section, um, one of which is the impact that zoning has on the local housing market. Um, zoning, as you probably know, is generally how we regulate um, where what types of things can get built. Um, and we know that due to the established wealth gap between black and white households, black households are still going to be more likely to rent. Um, and then when we think about how most residentially zoned land in the city um, is zoned either exclusively for single family or maybe single family and duplexes, which while not exclusively is more likely to be um, owner occupied, you can perhaps see how that could play into perpetuating patterns of segregation. Um, so we do have some data here, which Lily was able to map, um, showing the amount of rental units, which we know through our rental registration program in different portions of the city. And you can see that the amount of rental housing in different portions of the city really varies a lot, depending on what part of the city you're looking at. Um, so a major takeaway is that a significant portion of Urbana households are struggling to fit housing costs within their budget. Um, and that some groups are more likely to be experiencing this than others. Um, one statistic from a recent study of the ARP allocation plan is that um, there's an estimated shortage countywide of about 7,600 units, which would be affordable to households earning below the area median. Um, there are a lot of work that both the city and different organizations around the city are doing to address some of that affordability gap 
uh, gap, and we get into a lot of that in the what we do section. Unfortunately, we don't have time to touch on everything, um, but just as one example, this is another map Lily produced showing the location of um, habitat homes in different neighborhoods throughout the city. So that's just one affordable housing resource um, that the city and our partners are involved with. Um, one takeaway from looking at all the work in the city that's getting done around housing, though, that we wanted to touch on is that a lot of the funding is coming from federal sources, whether it's CDBG, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, um, Housing Choice Vouchers, or some of the uh, projects related to housing that are receiving funding through ARPA. Um, and federal money is great, obviously, and a lot of this work wouldn't happen without it. Um, but when we look, again, at the scale of the affordability gap and think about how, you know, again, nearly half of all rental households are cost burdened, um, we're also thinking about how absent some shift in federal policy that puts a lot more money into housing, which would be great, um, we're unlikely to fill that gap entirely using just federal funds anytime soon. So one of the things we wanted to touch on towards the end of the story map um, is whether there are things we could be doing on a local level, especially things which broadly fall within the purview of planning work that could help address some of that gap. So we look at some policies that have been tried in other communities, such as inclusionary zoning policies. There's a graphic for that here. Um, affordable housing overlays, accessory dwelling unit policies, community land trusts. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into all the specifics on those, but generally we looked at programs which aim to structure local regulations and incentives to hopefully be increasing local housing affordability. And just to explain this graphic a bit since it's up on the screen, um, this is an example of one type of inclusionary zoning program. Um, which couples an inclusionary uh, affordable unit incentive um, by allowing an extra unit or by allowing an extra story in developments that include affordable units. Um, the way this makes sense is by including more market rate units, those effectively subsidize the inclusion of affordable units. Um, so this isn't necessarily to endorse any particular policy that we mentioned in the story map. That would all take more research to look into the applicability of different programs to our local context. But we did want to at least be thinking about some things that we could be doing within planning to meet some local housing goals. Um, so I think I'm approaching, if not past my time allotment, that was hopefully a, a decent overview. Um, again, couldn't touch on everything, but I encourage everybody to go to the website and dig a little deeper. And we look forward to continuing this conversation with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. Anybody have a question? Go ahead, Marielle. So thank you. Um, it was a really nice presentation, but uh, the, the data is, is fascinating. Um, in, in addition to the exclusionary, inclusionary, sorry, uh, did you review any other um, municipalities and what, what they're doing with affordable housing? So I'm talking about Cambridge. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's, there's another really interesting example. Um, we look at a, a Cambridge, um, Cambridge, Massachusetts. They have what's called an affordable housing overlay. We have zoning overlays for other things. The way Cambridge's works is in certain portions of the city for developments, including a certain percentage of affordable units, um, kind of similar to the inclusionary zoning graphic. Um, They'll allow increased building height, um, maybe some reduced parking, especially if it's near transit, um, for developments that include affordable units. Again, that's another way of kind of internal to the development itself. Um, if you allow um, certain developments to take away things like parking or have a little additional height, that's going to allow them to get in more units overall. And when they're able to do that, that's able to offset some of the lower return they're going to get on affordable units. Um, so that's just one example um, we looked at. We also looked at um, community land trusts were another model. Yeah. Um, and I think we actually used some, uh, an Urbana property kind of as an example for the for just kind of expressing like what it would look like. You know, there's some parts of the town that have a lot of empty lots and they're the perfect size, not for a lot of things, but for some things like housing and um, what that would look like if the land costs were taken out of the equation. It's kind of like the 10% the rule. It's not a ton of the, the, the land value, but you're creating this land value that someone could really buy into, generate um, value from, and then eventually sell to create that, that stream flow for 
um, much like the Habitat homes where you actually saw empty lots being turned into $5.7 million worth of, of generational wealth. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And just want to say we will be hosting uh, some meetings, uh, one in each of the city wards, and we'll be doing an exercise. We invite the public. We'll be sending out some invitations, a lot of publicity around that. Uh, but it'll be a spending priority exercise where uh, the public can actually um, see some of the decisions that have to be made with a, with a limited budget to go from. So encourage everybody to look out for that. Thanks. Thank you. OK, next up is staff reports. Was that? Oh, gosh, you better believe it. Yeah. Um, we, we're now time for public input. Would anybody like to step to the microphone? You have five minutes to say whatever you would like. Going once, going twice. OK. Seeing none, we will now go to I staff email. report. I oh, haven't. sorry, email. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, um, Sharice. Sorry. Um, I'm getting too fast. Okay, this is uh, from Alan Max Axelrod. Good evening, Sharice. Please read the following at the Urbana City Council meeting of the whole meeting tonight. Urbana is a union town. Tomorrow will be the union election for the workers at the Vine Street Starbucks. There have been disgusting in instances of retaliation against Starbucks workers nationally and, near, and as nearby as Peoria. I ask that Urbana take a stand for workers' rights. Please say loudly and clearly to the Vine Street uh, Starbucks management that we will not tolerate nor accept any retaliation against the workers in our community in our union town. No one likes a bully, and abuses by management will not be ignored. I hope that the Urbana City Council we now have will voluntarily take this matter to task without the need for any pressure campaign. Whether it's a proclamation or a resolution or a visit to the Starbucks, I ask the Urbana City Council persons and the mayor to please be open with our community about how you are working to ensure management does not so much as attempt to retaliate against the workers on, at the Vine Street Starbucks. The rights we have are not enough. You need to step up to ensure your community is not going to join Peoria and being a witness to the gross retaliation efforts of the Starbucks Corporation. Oh, and by the way, the management that attempted the retaliation in Peoria was ultimately fired. Solidarity to the workers, Alan Max Axelrod. And um, Mayor Marlin has uh, also read the, the uh, email from Eldris Carr. So I was, I don't have to repeat that particular reading. Okay, and seeing no other um, public input, we'll close public input and go to staff reports. Nope, nothing today, okay. On to unfinished business. We'll start with ordinance number 2023-05-013, an ordinance authorizing the sale of certain real estate, that is, 903 North Division Street, 1605 Wiley, and 1107 North Gregory. And uh, community development will be presenting, I'm assuming. And in, yes, Sheila. Good evening. Um, this was brought to council on May 1st, and as a result of that meeting, there were some questions that were asked, so I followed up with the answers to those uh, in your packet. Uh, we plan on transferring the homes to the Housing Authority, who has a partnership with Cunningham Township to provide case management um, for those coming out of the prison system. So, does anybody have any questions on my memo? Uh, James, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I guess the question that's been asked um, at the last meeting and and brought up uh, from the township supervisor is what is the ability in what we're doing here to prioritize Urbana residents 
for utilizing this once it is in the housing authorities purview to manage right they will have a um tenant selection plan that will prioritize that and uh, the township and the housing authority and i had a, a call last week on this and so township will be very involved in the development of that tenant selection plan thank you mm -hmm. grace thanks sheila for answering those questions um I was kind of curious, I think you kind of clarified it, what justice involved meant, so even people coming out of the criminal justice system returning back to the community, which I think is really great, and there's very limited services and resources, so I think that's wonderful, and would encourage the powers that be to also um, consult or connect with first followers, since that's kind of their area of, spe of expertise. Um, I'm still trying to understand the requirements about affordable housing because you talked in your answer here about the retention requirements that will be transferred to housing authority. And I'm just trying to understand what that is. Is like, is that a document or is that based off the original funding? Like, what does that mean? Both. Um, so the 1107 North Gregory was built with home funds and because it was a rental unit, they require it to be affordable for 20 years. It's already been in existence for probably, I don't know, five or six years. And so we will, um, do a land use restriction agreement with them for the balance of that term. And then the ones, uh, 903 division and 1605 Wiley, um, the requirements for those, we got a uh, grant through the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. They required them to be affordable for 15 years and we've worked with them and have an agreement to transfer that requirement to housing authority. Thank so you. So that, that just kind of protects the city. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Chandra. So, in one of your uh, one of the questions was about um, the money of the from the sale of the properties to mm -hmm. the housing authority, and that going back into the CDBG fund. Um, it says that the social service grants would be increased for the upcoming year. Right. So, any program income that we receive, um, you can use fifteen percent of that on top of our normal fifteen percent of our allocation. So, it will increase the amount available for programming next year. Okay. And then the other eighty-five percent of the balance is that going to maybe go into like we the seniors who need roofs repair or whatever. It'll it'll go into our normal programming budget. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to see it go to something specific uh, that that relates to you know people staying in their homes or sure. getting their home repaired for low income families or that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, and it won't be the full amount going into CDBG because the home money will have to re return to the home funds. Okay. Any other questions? Can I make a motion? Yeah. Go ahead. All right, I will move ordinance number 2023-05013, an ordinance authorizing the sale of certain real estate at 903 North Division, 1605 Wiley, and 1107 North Gregory for approval. Second. Moved by Mary Alice, seconded by Grace. Discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Okay, that motion definitely passes. Uh, and we're on to new business. And the first item is ordinance number 2023-05-014, an ordinance adopting the International Code Council's 2021 code series. And again, community develop, development. Uh, Mr. Hansen will have the floor. Good evening. Uh, as mentioned, I uh, come before you tonight looking for uh, approval of the 2021 code series. Uh, we are currently in the process of adopting. Uh, this is the first step. Um, with city uh, approval, then I will have to notify the state of Illinois. Uh, and again, it'll be uh, 30 days with them uh, prior to implementation of the code. Um, currently, we are four cycles behind um, of the code cycle. So uh, we, along with Champaign, are both moving to the 2021 code. Um, they're finishing up their review process now. So we're just slightly ahead of them on uh, looking for approval. 
Mary Alice. Um, thank you. I, I have kind of an overarching question, which is, um, you know, Urbana has a lot of varying aging housing um, from things that are over 150 years old to things that have just been built this year. So whenever we update code, if I remember correctly, when I was looking at this, there are different requirements for older housing versus new construction. Um, but I, I do think that some of the older housing will be impacted by these changes. I'm hoping you could give us a little bit of examples of how that would happen. Correct. With every code cycle, there is what they call the existing building code. Um, so there's a section of the building code or residential code that actually addresses that. Um, and most of those things obviously can remain untouched. Really, the only time that they have to you know, see any change is if there's significant remodel. And there's actually stipulations in the code. If there's things that are existing, as long as you don't make them less compliant, they can remain. But there's things that, you know, again, if, if you can change it and make it better and bring it up to code, then, you know, then you need, you know, it's supposed to be done as well. So, um, you know, I think it would be helpful for builders and landlords and homeowners if there was I'll say a cheat sheet, right? Like here, here's a highlights of some of the big changes that are coming with this code. Um, so that it's easier to digest because right now it's a very long, our, our packet was a thousand pages long. <laughs> Getting through it was challenging. So I, I don't feel comfortable actually approving this tonight without having a better clarification of something that people can easily digest. So is that something that you can provide to the public and to council? I mean, yeah, we can work on, on that. The actual, I mean, the I included the um, the minutes from the Building Safety Board of Appeals, and th those are the significant, what we call the significant changes, and that's only, you know, a few pages long, um, you know, as far as the actual building code. Um, because, again, this is, you know, the code changes every, you know, every four years, or excuse me, every three years, you know, on a cycle, and basically not every code changes, right? You know, they... They change them as, as their significant, you know, um, issues, right? You know, basically their worst case scenarios. So it's the minimum code standard. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can work on, you know, that. Um, but like I said, it's, I mean, the significant codes are not that change. You know, what we would consider significant, you know, is not a, a vast amount. So, so let me rephrase. I, I had heard that with this change that everybody would be required to have 15-year uh, smoke alarms, for example. So all the smoke alarms would need to be replaced if they weren't meeting that 15-year. Those are the types of things that I think would be helpful for people to understand what the impact directly on them this code would have as they try and remodel or repair or whatever, if they have to go and get a, a building permit, then you have to have everybody come in and you have to have the inspectors and so forth. So th that's kind of what I'm looking for, if, if that makes sense. So unfortunately, again, it, so much of the code depends on, on exactly what you're doing, right? So there's like, for example, the building code, it actually breaks it into three different tiers. You know, so if you're doing, you know, X, you know, you don't, you may not have to do, you know, anything. If you're doing B, then, you know, you've got to bring this up. If you're doing C, then it's a whole nother, you know, level. As far as the smoke alarms, that's actually state law. So that's not the code. That's that, you know, so again, those, those are the things that, you know, that's been adopted. That became a, a law January 1st of this year. So, but again, that's not covered in the code. That's the state of Illinois law. All right. So, um... I mean, I don't want to belabor the point here. Sure, no, I mean, I... Um, but I, I just think that it would be helpful. I understand the complexity in terms of things, but there should be something very straightforward that people can read through. Maybe it's the state law changing. Maybe it's the city law changing. But, you know, these are good facts for people to understand as, as they think through um, remodels. The last thing that we want people to do is to not remodel. Right? So we want people to keep their housing up to date. And if we put some kind of roadblocks in front of them that say, well, if you make this change, then you're going to have to rip all this out and change this as well. So that's what I'm trying to prevent because I want to be able to give the residents and the business owners the ability to improve things by not getting um, buried under, under changes that they might not be aware of. Chandra. Um, was it just me or was this included in the paper? 
It was not okay. I didn't. I didn't think so. We had a thousand pages, and this wasn't included. Um, but did was the email um, that was sent to council passed along to you about um, some perhaps errors that they that a person found in the code um, related to uh, what is it? Article the property maintenance code article. No. Okay. Um, they said that. Um, I can forward this along to you, and perhaps you can look at it and um, try try to answer their question. And if it is an error or a typo, um, that could be. Sure. Uh, Jay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just noticing there's gendered language in this. Is there a, a plan to move toward gender neutral language in compliance with the expectations for the city in general? I will. I can take a look at that. Thank you. Grace. Thanks for taking all our questions here. Yes, it's a lot of stuff. Um, I would second um, Jay's comment about going towards gender neutral language. Also Mary Alice's about having a kind of simpler version for the public on what are the changes when someone needs to do renovations, right? And then also clarifying that there is some grandfathering for existing buildings, but it's when they want to make changes where you could open up this can of worms and things that are ideally, you know, safer and more efficient and some positive upgrades. But I definitely hear that concern and I think more digestible thing for the public would be great. Um, I was wondering if we could add on another request to you, if it'd be possible to see what was changed after that committee meeting, because I appreciated the minutes and the changes, but there were some I couldn't tell what changes were made, um, like when it was talking about the state versus international codes. And I, when I went back and read it, I couldn't tell if that had already, how that had been changed from the meeting before and after, if that makes sense. So if you could tell us um, throughout the next time a comparison of before and after the board meeting, what was changed just to highlight what those changes were. Okay. And I was wondering if you could speak to energy efficiency. Um, are we sticking with a 2009 or is there any changes to increased energy efficiency requirements in this round? So the International Energy Conservation Code, again, that's actually uh, adopted by the state of Illinois. That's not adopted by local jurisdictions. So they're actually uh, in the process of adopting the 2021 uh, International Energy Code, um, but it actually was kicked back because the uh, based on the governor's requirements or request, it did not, there were some amendments they made that made it less stringent. And so basically they actually had it uh, overviewed and no, uh, they're not gonna allow any amendments to the energy code that's less efficient than what the code itself is. So whereas before in the past years, there's been you know a few things where they've made it less stringent and you know based off of this year's they will not nothing will be less stringent than the code itself so are we still operating under is it the state 2009 uh code and you're saying they're working on a 2021 update currently we're under the 2018 energy code so and like i said that's adopted by the state typically the year following its release by the time they go through the process and the hearings and such so it's adopted by the state, but then it's basically passed down to the local jurisdictions to enforce. Thank you. Mary Alice. So I'd like to uh, make a motion to hold this in council um, with some further clarification on the items that we discussed tonight. In committee? Back to committee. Are, are you asking to hold it in committee? You said in council. Yes, yeah, sorry. Just committee. clarifying. I'm yeah, happy to second that if it's in committee. It's committee. Thank yes, you. you're right. Jay, are you seconding? Yeah. Okay. So moved by Mary Alice to send it to com committee. Seconded by Jay. Any discussion? Okay. Oh, go ahead, Cherise. I, I just want to know if there's a particular deadline that w we need to meet regarding this, you know, voting on this voting to adopt it, is there a deadline that needs to, that we need to keep in mind? There's not a, it's an internal deadline is the only thing. Like I said, okay. once it's approved by council, then I have to notify JCAR with the state and it sits there for 30 days before we can adopt it. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay. I wanna add something. Oh, go ahead, Muriel. 
So you had mentioned there were some state rules that had changed. If you do have an opportunity to make something up, it would be good to highlight what those changes are um, in the state law as well. After you take your vote, if I could just um, ask a few questions of council to give us guidance about what you're looking for, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Okay, are we ready to vote? Um, looks like it. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Risenberry? No. Okay, on a six to one, the ordinance is sent back to committee. Um, Carol Mitten, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so, so I think this is a little bit challenging for, for staff, us, to figure out exactly what you're looking for and give you something productive. And, and here's why, and maybe Nick can help me out after I, after I take a stab at this, which is I think in terms of understanding the code, we typically look to professionals. I mean, the people that, that you deal with in terms of the, the um, sort of technical elements of the electrical code and the plumbing code and so forth are, are professionals. And they, they have actually, and you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, because uh, this is me trying to, you know, um, understand your world, um, they are familiar with the international codes. And it's a question of, so sometimes it's like, are you using the 2021 or are you still, you know, so they're, they're, they're familiar with it. So if we attempt to capture the things that have changed, first of all, it's not just what's changed in the international code from the last time the international code was issued. It's changed from our version of that. And then it's what is relevant to a homeowner for instance, because we don't want them, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they generally can't do plumbing on their own. Don't they have to use a licensed plumber? There's certain things they can't do, right? Correct. If you own the house and live in the house, you can do your own plumbing work. You still have to get a permit. Okay. But if you do not either own the house or live in the house, or excuse me, if you do not own the house and live in the house, then yes, you have to hire a licensed plumber. Okay. So if we make a list then is the list intended to be comprehensive? Because if we make a list and we leave something off the list and someone says, well, I relied on the list that you published, and it's like, well, that was a representative list, not a comprehensive list. So do you, do you see what I'm struggling with here is trying to give you what you're looking for, but not giving the public a misleading sense of what the document actually is. Uh, Mary Alice, you have the floor. So, I mean, I'm certainly not a professional plumber or electrician or, you know, a, a subcontractor or anything like that. I, you know, to the, to the regular homeowner, you're looking for things like, um, I'll give you an example of electrical. So electrical, you have uh, the fuses, right? So you have different kinds of fuses. So is the requirement going to be that we pull out the knob and tube and then replace it with a standard one? That would be a big impact on a particular person who wants to upgrade their thing. So... I guess I understand the, the, the difficulty in that there's lots of nitty gritty details in the code that the general public is just not gonna understand, myself included. Um, but if we think about things like uh, sewers, like is there a different change in terms of how we connect to the sewer? I'm just giving an example. These kind of layman terms, rather than we go from a five inch diameter to a six inch diameter, we don't need that level of stuff. But then your, your second question I think was more about how comprehensive does the list need to be? If that, yes. That's part of it, yeah. Um, and I, I understand that we aren't going to be 100% comprehensive. It'd be great if we could aim for that 80% um, of the big ticket things. That, that's what I'm kind of looking for. So I guess kind of piggybacking on that, is you know are you looking just for residential because again when we talk about the code series we're talking about the residential code the building code the um fire code i mean the existing building code you know the whole list you know if yeah. you're talking which I'm, generally outside of residential you're gonna you know by state law you have to use an architect you know so it has to be a design professional you know so again you know if you're looking just for, that obviously narrows it down to, to one book um, you know, and significant changes there. But again, like I said before, is the thing to remember is, you know, if it's existing and you don't touch it, the code doesn't require you to change it. So, you know, again, if you have nom two wiring, no, we don't allow you to put that in today. Right. But if you don't touch it, you know, you don't have to do anything with it. If it's there, and even if you're remodeling it, if you're not touching it, you know, 
then you, it's still usable if it long as it's in a good safe condition so that's the big thing like i said that's what the existing code is is like i said if you know as long as you don't make it any worse than what it is then it, it, it's acceptable so I, I know this covers a lot of different things and i would assume that the any new construction right you'd have you, you're starting from scratch so having new rules it's not that big of a deal as long as you have the book that tells you what the rules are um then the second piece was you know I guess this would only be for a, a residential or maybe a small apartment complex. I don't know where the lines are in terms of residential. I mean, do apartments fall into residential? I would assume they would. So, no. They uh, don't. Residential code is one and two family dwellings. If oh, you're, that's right. If you're I read three, that. If you're three or more units, then it becomes a building. It falls under the building code. Okay. Interesting. Chair. Yeah. So I, I think for me, at least in terms of clarification, some of it is the count, a lot of the council didn't even have a chance to see this because it wasn't in the paper packets. So this is a long document. It's an important document for people to understand. Um, and so I think it's important for, for folks to have a chance to review it. And, and there was a question from the public about whether something was inaccurate or if there was confusion around it. And then there's also the, the question about whether or not we're going to continue to follow this general guidance for the city, which is to include gender neutral language. So I think there are some... I will defer to others in terms of other information that is needed, but those are the pieces that for me would be helpful. Okay, and, and, and I, I do wanna say I'm perfectly happy that it's still in committee and, and um, the gender neutral piece got past me, so I, I apologize. I feel like I, I, I let you down on that one. The email that I'm aware of that you're, I think you're referring to from Esther Pat is actually not related to this. It, it's not related to the building code changes. It's, it's related to the building maintenance code, but it's a completely separate issue, which we'll be um, preparing a, a response um, for that. So um, really just my questions were trying to make, th this has the potential, what you're asking for is a big um, commitment of staff time. Um, and we and so I'm just trying to frame it out because I, I don't know that that's your intent. So um, I, I just want to make sure we understand and don't um, spend more time than is really what you're looking for. So just to follow up real quickly, I don't expect it to be 100% exhaustive. Um, I, I I really want to make it easy for people to understand, and, and I understand getting into the weeds and so forth can can lead you down some rabbit holes. So I'm looking for high level changes, um, whether that's remodeling a kitchen, for example, these are some new things that we're going to ask for, for old kitchens. I'm just... James. Yeah, what, what, I, what I'm thinking of is in terms of the articles you read on the last week of December where someone says, here are the eight things about state law that are changing that you should be aware of, right? This, this should be something that is summary of changes that a, a, a common person should be aware of, not a, you know, changes to how you wire a switch or an outlet or a thing. This needs to be what the lay person who would do this for themselves should know that's a distinctive change. And I, and, and so I would, I would ask that if we're going to make a list like that we we do it from that perspective of you know here are the the big 10 things or the here are the things that stick out that are gotchas for people that they might not pay attention to rather than some kind of comprehensive list which i which i don't think is necessary and i also think uh a lot of people shouldn't be getting into they they a lot a lot of people do their own work but it has to be it has to be uh, permitted and inspected if they're doing their own work like this. So somebody should see those kinds of things and they should depend on uh, professionals, good union labor to get it done. Thanks. Sharice. I guess, I guess what I'm trying to understand from between the two <laughs> of you, three of you, uh, is uh, are we looking for, from, from, for you and for James, are we looking for something like um, remodeling for dummies? Like, you know, this is, you can't, you can no longer use, you have to, you know, you can't use three quarter drywall now, you have to use uh, an inch drywall or two inch drywall, or you can't use this particular 
the type of spackle that now now this kind of spackle if you're going to respackle something or if you, that's what I'm trying to understand because when I look at the because uh, we did discuss this on some uh, one on ones or something when we were talking about the manual the the new manual and I I think that mainly um, I don't and I don't have a problem with keeping this in committee until I can so I can absorb more things. But I think mainly what I'm thinking about is that mostly contractors and plumbers and electricians and so on and so forth will have to abide by these new um, new adaptations to the um, to the uh, the codes, the international codes. Not generally um, our DIY kind of person or DIY person <laughs> that. Um, is just trying to maybe add a um, little extra space or a shelf or something into their house. Uh, I don't, and as long, it's kind of like what, what um, Grace was saying also is it, a lot of stuff gets grandfathered in and anyway, and as long as you don't like accidentally blow out all of your electrical in your house because you were putting in a, a different light fixture or something, um, then you don't really have to, you don't have to worry about it unless the electrician that comes in to fix that goes, oh, this is out of code. Am I correct in thinking that kind of thing? Again, if it, if they're, it's not being touched, then it's considered existing and it's you know can stay there. And the hard thing on on this whole thing is, you know, you have houses that were built in the 1900s, you have houses that were built in the 1970s, you have houses that were built in the 1990s. So again, the code cycles and some of them probably haven't been updated since those time periods, right? So again, so how do you write an ex exhaustive list or even a list that's you know 50% accurate because you know the things that you know are going to be required in one may not be required in the other and again a lot of it's so much of it's going to depend on the amount of work you know and for example again like you know there's things that don't require a permit you know if you're going to you know hang new cabinets or do new flooring or those sorts of things like you know the permits not required so again like it's you know trying to find that balance of getting the information out there but not making it to where people are like well you didn't have that on here i didn't know how to do it you know so that's mm -hmm. kind of you know the hard thing well because i also think in terms of the fact like um with with my mom's house her insurance company required a rewiring of her house not the city okay so that that can that may be one thing i guess if if we want to talk about the what the international you know the upgrade of those codes are i guess we can you might want to let the homeowner know something about that just if nothing else to educate them on what kind of electrician they may <laughs> need to come in and and do that but um i don't i don't understand i'm just trying to keep a um i'm just i'm just trying to get an idea of how how far we really want to go with having something comprehensive for the public as well that that's what i just want to understand Go ahead, Mariel. All right, oh, this will be my last comment. Um, I, I like James as I. Sorry about that. Okay, um, I, I like James's example of having like the top eight or top ten or top five, whatever it may be. These are the big changes that you need to think about when you're going to be remodeling. I understand the difference between the years and so forth. Um, the disclaimer is going to have to be things are going to be different based on the, how old your house is, right? And these are just examples, some highlighted examples of the code, but all the details are in the code. So. I don't know if that answers Carol. Does that answer your question? We're gonna we're gonna do something and we're gonna bring it to you. And okay. hopefully that'll All be right. good. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. I'm liking that. Okay. <laughs> do you have any questions for us or do you feel like you've got clear direction sort of kinda? Oh sure. <laughs> okay. There's going to be something coming. All right. Anything else? Go ahead, Grace. 
Thank you. Uh, just, I just reiterate my two cents. Um, I think we're not asking for a whole technical manual and this kind of so it can be less than more. Like the idea of just the general announcement that there's been an update to changes. Some things may impact you. Maybe even that disclaimer like you explained to us about where is residential and where is building code where you need a professional saying if you choose to do these on your own, here's a few highlights. And again, that disclaimer that this is not a comprehensive list and that you should check this actual code for more details. I think it could be fun to try and limit it to just like a page or two, like not rewriting a whole technical manual, just a little blurb for the public pointing to more information. If there's anyone they can contact for questions, anything like that, or even just say contact, you know, a uh, contractor. And then also just wanted to reiterate too that we're also looking into the gender neutral language and the changes from the committee. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? All right, that looks like it. about it. Thank you for the presentation and we'll look forward to... Oh, we did vote to, to yes, you're right, the committee. Yes, you're, right, you're okay, right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, but thanks for... Okay. Um, all right, uh, community development will be next, and Mary Ellis, you're on. I'm on? Well, uh, All right, so um, I, I think the order is, is that I make a motion for a package of the um, items, uh, 2 through 19. And then, that, yes, yeah, so that's my I'm, motion is to I'm make that package. Is there a second? second? Okay, we have a second. Uh, any quick discussion? S go ahead, Jay. I'm just letting folks know that I will be uh, abstaining for the discussion on uh, the youth services grants because of a, a conflict of interest. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so we will have a... Are we okay? Point, point okay. of order, could we, could we leave uh, one off so that Jay can participate in the... The, the recommendation I was given was to abstain from any discussion or vote on this matter. Okay, thanks. Thanks, James. Okay, uh, so we're going to have a voice voice vote to uh, on the motion to uh, bundle this into an omnibus package, the agenda items 2 through 19. All in favor say aye. 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 All in, against say nay. The ayes have it. So we will have, this will be one omnibus uh, package and uh, Braden, you are uh, you are on, sir. Good evening, everyone, and I apologize for the amount of paper uh, with, on this packet. Um, so, on the agenda tonight are the youth services grant agreements for the upcoming fiscal year, fiscal year 2023 through 2024, beginning on July 1. So, again, as was previously mentioned, this is items 2 through 19 on your agenda. And on your monitor, you see this is um, just a high-level overview of the, um, the agencies and the programs that we will be funding this fiscal year. Um, you see uh, on the middle column the funding request and then the, uh, the recommended amount there as well. Also in your packet um, is more details on the programs that we're funding. Um, that's in attachment two. And then the evaluation tool that was used to score the uh, applications and to make funding recommendations is can be found in attachment three. So as noted in your memo, um, the total amount of funding that we had available this year for our Youth Services Grant Program was $300,000. That amount comes from three separate pots of money, $75,000 from city general funds, $25,000 from the Community Development Block Grant Public Service funding, and then $200,000 from a State of Illinois uh, DCEO grant um, for, for violence prevention programming. So in total, as you can see on the chart there, the total amount that we are um, able to award this grant cycle is $298,094 to local agencies that are providing community-based programming and services to low-income urban youth. And I want to just say uh, a huge thank you to all of the agencies that applied. We received really phenomenal applications. Um, this was a really, a really great pool of applicants, and we're excited to be able to offer funding to each, to each agency that applied. We did, as you'll see on the chart and also as noted in your memo, we did reduce some funding requests. Um, however, we were able to offer funding to every agency that applied, which is really exciting. 
I also just wanted to say a thank you to everyone who served on the, um, uh, the grant uh, review committee, uh, Council Member Mary Alice Wu, Council Member Grace Wilkin, and then uh, Deshaun Williams, who is a member of our Community Development Commission. Um, your insight on these applications and on the funding recommendations was really invaluable. Um, so staff recommends that the committee um, sends the omnibus package to city council consent agenda with a recommendation for approval And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have Anybody have any questions? Mary Alice Thank you for um, always organizing this so well I, I feel like the process just gets better and better every iteration So thank you for all of your work on this um, If I remember correctly we had talked a little bit about uh, kind of fee for service um, and uh, what that means is for for every child in Urbana you get X number of dollars if you provide this service and I thought that that was big brothers big sisters did we do that for the rides is that right yes and that's in their grant agreement so right. basically what that enables us to do is there's a reporting process so every agency that we fund will have to submit quarterly reports and also quarterly reimbursement requests and in those uh, reports they will indicate the number of Urbana youth that they're serving there's a little form that they have to fill out and then they're getting re reimbursed for that um, for those residents up to the, the cap that is the funding recommendation and was there was one other one that we were doing that too but I can't remember which one we had recommended um, it was it, it was um, was it Sola Gratia? the refugee center, oh, program refugee as center. Well. yeah that's yes. right the mm -hmm. the um, yeah okay I just wanted to highlight that because it is a lot of paper for people to read and maybe they didn't catch those two pieces. Um, but that was, those were the only two that it was basically you get paid for every Urbana person that you assist on a quarterly basis. Everything else is a grant. Yeah, and we do okay. realize that a lot of these agencies, you know, reach across Wright Street. So we just want to make sure that the funding is going specifically toward Urbana uh, residents. Okay, anybody else? Chandra, I just, I just hate, I hate that we had to use this much paper, and can we like look into not ever doing this again? I mean, I, no, I'm serious because how I would appreciate that. How many trees are these? Um, I think that like this chart and the memo probably could have been sufficient, and same way with this ARPA stuff too. But just FYI for future. You have to have the resolutions that you're voting on too. Okay, and and you know the resolution page. That's fine. Grace. Uh, just another thank you to everyone who applied, the committee and staff, Braden. It was great um, working with this on this as well. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be involved. I really appreciated that. And I'm really excited to see these programs for youth go out, and I hope that we can continue and continue to grow this program too, right? Because I think this funding is up even from last year, and I hope that we can continue it and continue to grow because I think this is really important to fund those who specialize in this kind of stuff where the city might not be making our own, you know, tutoring program here in the city building after school, but there are groups that specialize in this and we can support them. So thank you so much for that. Any other, James? Do you need a motion to approve the omnibus? Uh, you better let me handle this, okay? I, I do need a motion, and uh, I'm gonna ask that a motion be made to approve uh, the following resolutions to be sent to the consent agenda of the next city council meeting, the following resolutions. Could you oh, keep it me? off the consent agenda so I can vote on other things on the consent agenda? Okay, uh, this will be on just to the regular council meeting. Very good, thank you, Jaya. Um, resolution number 2023-05-034R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a sub-recipient agreement, youth services agreement, business elevator, 21st century readiness. Resolution number 2023-05-035R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution execution of a sub-recipient agreement, youth services agreement, Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, CU Farm to School. 
Resolution number 2023-05-036 R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, youth services agreement, Urbana Park District Youth Scholarship Program. Resolution number 2023-05-037 R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, youth services agreement, Urbana Park District Pickup Basketball League. Resolution number 2023-05-038R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, youth services agreement, Urbana Park District Fresh Teen Hangout. Resolution number 2023-05-039R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, youth services agreement, Urbana Park District, again, outreach swim lessons. Resolution number 2023-05-040 R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, Rape Advocacy and Counseling and Education Services, Survivor Services Trauma Therapy. Resolution number 2023-05-041R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, community development block grant agreement, rape advocacy, counseling and education services, survivor services, trauma therapy. Resolution number 2023-05-042R, Resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, East Central Illinois Mutual Assistance Center, Newcomer Immigrant Student Support. Resolution number 2023-05-043R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, Crisis Nursery, Safe Children Program. Resolution number 2023-05-044R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, DREAM, Hope Scholars Mentoring Program. Resolution number 2023-05-045R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Central Illinois, Community-Based Mentoring Program. Resolution number 2023 05 Dash zero four six R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, Champaign County Regional Planning Commission, Youth Assessment Center. Resolution number 2023, my, uh, Dash zero five dash zero four seven R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement of the State of Illinois, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, Sola Gracia Agricultural Education Program Center. Resolution number twenty twenty three dash zero five dash zero. 48R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, Steam Genius DBA Hip Hop Express Urbana Loving You Tour. Resolution number 2023-05-049R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, the Well Experience, Well Kids Learning Hub. Resolution number 2023-05-050R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, Urbana Connection, Neighborhood Connections, Community Study Center. 
and resolution number 2023-05-051R, resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a subrecipient agreement, State of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Agreement, Urbana Neighborhood Connections, Youth Urbana Youth Development Program. All these to be moved to the uh, City Council meeting. Do I have a motion? I'll, I'll make that motion. I'll second. Moved by Mary Alice, seconded by James. Any discussion? James. Yeah, I just want to reiterate the, the thanks to staff, uh, to the council members, and the community development uh, committee uh, board member that helped with this. This is a great collection of agencies that are doing great work in our community. It's really satisfying to be able to support them in these projects. Thank you. Anybody else? Chandra. Yeah, I too am, am happy to see the, the breadth of programs that have applied this, this um, funding cycle. Um, I think we see some, some new names and some familiar ones too. So I'm glad to see that the, the opportunity is hitting more um, organizations and um, the funding amount is, is very significant this, this year. So I'm happy to see that too. Thank you. Okay, uh, th these are all resolutions, so this will be a vo voice vote. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, in, all opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and that will be sent to the next city council meeting. And just noting again, I'm abstaining from voting, making sure that's in the record. Yeah, that, that's right, with an abstention from Alder person Cole City. Okay, you're on. All right, um, I'd like to... Uh, make a motion that we package the agenda items 20 to 32. Great. Second, uh, uh, seconded by, I'm going to give it to Sharice. Um, moved by Mary Alice, seconded by Sharice. Um, Grace. I had an abstention from one of these, item 21, um, if we could separate that one. And then when we bundle, we can still discuss individual ones when we bundle them, correct? Yeah, yeah. You, you, so I'd say item 21, if we could pull that one for Champaign County Environmental Stewards, please. Um, I, I'm okay with that adjustment. So then we would be packaging item 20 through 32 minus 21. Is that correct? Um, clerk, would it be better if we bundle them first and then make an amendment motion to separate out? Uh, she just did that. Okay. And she okay. asked for that to, to be taken out. You don't have to repeat. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, so, um, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Okay. So, they are bundled except uh, for 21, Grace. Is that right? Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, community, I mean, uh, Will, you, uh, front and center. Uh, you, you are called off the bench, and you'll be uh, presenting. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that I made my resolution title shorter, so mine should be a little bit easier to get through. And I think I had a couple less. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, before the council tonight are 13 ARPA resolutions. Supper. All right, does it just have to be closer? All right, sorry about that. So before the city council tonight are 13 resolutions and to, and to enter into ARPA subrecipient agreements. The city of Urbana, uh, just a little bit of history, approved the concept plan list on February 27th and allocated just shy of $10 million of funds to 25 projects. And as part of that allocation, each project must enter into a subrecipient agreement that details the dates, funding distribution, timeline, performance standards, reporting requirements, and any additional terms and conditions. So before the council today are 13 agreements representing about $6.8 million worth of funds. 10 projects were previously approved, or the subrecipient agreements were previously approved by city council. And then the two remaining projects are projects that are being undertaken by the city, and they don't have a subrecipient agreement because we don't have one with ourselves. But we do have, uh, I can, I'll get to it later, but we do have something for us, city projects. So overall, the awarded projects were from, all the ARPA projects were funded at about 53% of their request on average. 
And generally speaking, subrecipients have responded to this partial level funding in one or two way, one of two ways or a combination of both, either reducing their project scope proportionally to the funding request or fu utilizing other funds. So in the memo today, I did highlight a couple projects that have um, non-routine adjustments um, from when the project allocation came out. So I'll just go over those real briefly. So the Urbana Park District uh, has requested that all two million of their funds be, be distributed upfront in a single upfront payment. And the reason behind this one is that by having a single upfront payment, it will save them a significant amount of interest rate expenses that they would occur um, by issuing debt for their project. So uh, talking to the Park District, by issuing it all upfront, it saves them the most amount of interest expense, what they estimate to be about 250000 Quarterly reimbursements does have some expense, but not nearly as much um, when you have, I think it was maybe 160, it's in attachment A in their document of the 700 pages that were in your packet, um, or 700 ARPA pages that were in your packet at least. Um, so the upfront payment of $2 million saves them the most interest rate expense, so that's the logic behind that one. Cunningham, Town Cunningham Township has modified as another one that has slightly different uh, change to the project scope since the allocation was made. So during the allocation process, um, during the discussion, council gave some general direction that the funds were for 390,000 for direct assistance and 268,000 and change for facilities. Uh, the subrecipient agreement in front of you today has a little bit slightly different uh, allotment of the funds for $300,000 for direct assistance, 148 and change for facilities, and 210 for personnel. And the logic behind this one was that Cunningham Township needs personnel in order to allocate those direct assistance funds. A third project that had slightly different from the standard uh, adoptions were, or changes was, was, was Champaign Township. They were funded at 25% of the request, so they neither decreased their scope nor have they secured alternative funds, which this isn't really a significant change from the project I proposed. It just simply kind of makes the date in which there's a funding gap closer than they originally proposed. So no changes, just the funding gap occurs quicker. And then Champaign County Environmental Stewards, um, they've had some modifications to their project scope since they were um, allocated funds. Uh, the whole the concept hasn't really changed, um, except the, the small changes that they have um, are as opposed to the application contemplated a renovation of a site where they are now is they have a single site that they're looking at that they're ready to purchase and build a new facility at. Additionally, their timeline has been elongated from when they're purchasing the site to when the capital campaign will be completed. Um, so those are kind of the two big ones. Um, what that does from the city perspective is they have, with the two phases, um, there's you know, a large gap between when the city's ARPA funds will be used and when the project um, will have all the funds that it needs to be um, successful. So we did add a condition for that project um, that mostly states that the site has to be used for something that's within the overall intent of the ARPA funds, and you can read the entire condition there. And then we also, as part of that, we requested them to provide a little bit more timely updates along the process so that we can be aware of how things are going. And the last project that has a little bit of a change from when the projects were allocated funds was the Champaign County EDC and Justine Peterson. So if you remember, the application was kind of a joint proposal between Champaign County and the EDC and Justine Peterson, whereas the subrecipient agreement um, from a technical perspective is just with Justine Peterson although the subrecipient agreement does specify um, how Champaign County EDC will be involved. So they're still working together, but the recipient agreement is just with the EDC. So that's really the quick overview of all the projects. I think we've talked about them a lot, so that's all I have today. Thank you. Any questions? Chandra. I kind of want to go back to the environmental stewards um, thing. So when does their campaign begin, do you know? I can try and give some guesses, but also uh, Susan Monty in, in the audience, who's the expert. Is your mic? Sorry. Several of the subrecipients are here. If you have questions, um, if not, we can always reach out to them. But um, I can look it up really quick on the um, for and attachment then, A. And then while you're looking that up, the uh, additional question would be, OK, if the campaign fails, which I hope it does not, um, and 
the already the already purchased land or whatever other things they purchased with ARPA funds, they would have to use that spot um, to provide safe waste disposal. How does that happen? I, I, I guess I'm just trying to see how that would happen if they don't have. Mm -hmm. So the the camp the purchase of the property in the beginning of kind of the prep work for the campaign starts in the third quarter of this year. And then the campaign is running for uh, about a year and a half with construction, um, according to the schedule, s st slotted to begin in the first quarter of 2025. So that's kind of the, the duration of that timeline. Um, the second question was, how does the, how do we, what is, can you repeat the second part? Sorry. <laughs> I know. Uh, I just, I guess, I'm trying to figure out how to formulate the question. Like, if it's unsuccessful and they don't get enough money to build a building, and we they've already we've already given them the ARPA funds. Like, what what does that look like? What does mm -hmm. project's original intent of providing opportunities for safe waste disposal to urban residents look like in the event they don't have enough money to build a building or whatever it is? So there's a, a couple things I didn't include in the packet. Um, you know, we talked about this with the um, environmental stewards. They have a couple different options that they could. Um, we didn't put those options as the requirements and the conditions to keep it a little bit more vague, um, but I can share the list that they shared. But that's not an exclusive list. There's just a couple different recycling alternatives that are not um, maybe as, uh, as an ideal use. It's not what they want, but um, you could use it for a certain type of recycling activities. Okay. Um, so I have something that I can share with you later okay. if you'd like. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that we knew or they had an idea of what could be done in the event it doesn't happen. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, and especially with the way that um, we structured the agreement where, you know, with the timeline, um, you know, and, and the having the multiple reports, the additional reports is um, if, you know, we're, if we're working towards that way, it won't, um, there'll be an opportunity to provide input as well um, as part of this contract. So it's not a, a one and done and we never see it. Um, if it, you know, in the worst case scenario where it doesn't look like it's going to succeed from the ARPA standpoint, then there's opportunities to kind of discuss it further. Sure. Um, the question that I have uh, regarding this this huge skein of of paper uh, also is that um, on with the revolution with the resolutions uh, was included but not mentioned the uh, memorandum of understanding that between the city of Urbana regarding. Um, the uh, relining of the laterals as well as the um, roof uh, um, repair uh, mm -hmm. uh, monies that we that we uh, allocated, and I I just want an um, because there was an earlier email as well as uh, constituents, and I've been getting also um, uh, calls regarding why what that is and but I wanted to also understand and have it explained I kind of understand but I need it explained for my constituency why their why this memorandum of understanding is not included in the resolutions yeah so the the and I said I would mention it and then I failed to mention it so there's the two city projects with the sanitary sewer and the roof replacement so those are not a resolution um, I think from a technical perspective, you, you can't, I think, um, there's not a need to enter into agreement with ourselves um, from that perspective. So um, what we did is, and you know, I know there's been some talk on a federal level about clawing back ARPA funds. Um, so to memorialize the allocation, uh, we borrowed something that our grants division has done for other grant projects that, Speak you know, up, speak up, into the thing. So we borrowed kind of a technique from our grants division that they use for other federal funds when there's an obligation to obligate the funds by a certain time is uh, we signed a, an MOU between different departments um, that just solidifies the project scope and the project timeline. The way we structure those MOUs, uh, we call them something different, but they follow the same format as all the resolutions. So you'll see a couple pages of very generic, boring MOU language. We have the single page attachment A that has the timeline kind of the, the gist of the scope, and then you have the executive summaries and presentations all attached to it. So it follows the same format. It uses a different terminology just because it's the city doesn't need to enter agreement with itself necessarily. But there needs to be something documented that the city will be getting ARPA funds 
for these particular projects. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. So it's so that if ever there's when the commitment deadline is 2024. This way, once that deadline passes, we can say to the U.S. Treasury, "Look, our funds are committed. Here's the official document that we have with ourselves." So it's a it's a formal step to officially allocate the funds internally from a federal reporting standpoint. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Grace. Um, along the line with the MOU for the sewer laterals <laughs> in your, like I explained, boring legal language, um, I was trying to understand the termination there, the non-performance and termination um, saying that I guess the city can terminate the MOU in writing to public works. Um, but I don't know if there's a, what's the contingency plan there and does it come back? I'm not saying the process where it might come back as like a public council kind of decision mm -hmm. or what happens in that case. So I don't have a kind of written decision tree in my head of what would happen if an internal city project failed. Um, I think the natural result would be it just kind of, it would remain or go back to the city's ARPA fund that we have and um, a, a decision at that point would have to be made. But um, I don't have anything specific for that question. If What happens if that one failed or didn't get completed? Could we clarify that in here? Would that be possible to add just a little, you know, would if, you know, if it's terminated, then that money goes to other designated ARPA things and kind of restart that? process because it just seems to me like if that weren't the case then that would be to me this would be a bigger deal if we terminate it than just say oh public works we're terminating that seems like that'd be a whole big process then what do we do with the money and who makes those decisions and so i just didn't see that in here um i mean i we can add some language the from one thing that i heard though is we don't have any other arpa allocations or um fund or programs to give it to at this point it's um so we would have to take undertake a new process, is what. So you want. So what you're saying is you want to say that in the MOU. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think that's. I think that is exactly what I'm getting at. So gotcha. just that even say in a few years with a whole new council and stuff too, and we forget like this ARPA fund. Now what happens? I think it might be important to lay out what are the steps to that. You know, not as detailed, but saying you know it will go to other or in a pool of ARPA funds and be determined through a process with council about how those funds would be spent. I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is um, you're saying you are you are suggesting that the MOU if terminated why would it be terminated I want to understand that hypothetical um, for me or you are grace she brought it up I'm my take is I don't understand why it would be terminated anyway so I brought it up because it's written as point number five, non-performance and termination already in there. And as Will nicely said, some of that standard boring language in any contract that there's always typically some termination. Mm -hmm. So it says based on non-performance. So I'm guessing that means if it weren't completed in time, um, which I think that we don't anticipate, I don't anticipate that to be the case, um, but it might also not be all or nothing. What if by the timeline there's some money, some work remaining? I don't know. Okay. I, I, okay. That's a better explanation for me, at least. I guess the thing that I'm thinking in terms of is regarding, since it has to be spent by a certain time, um, that if, like, let's say we just, th that some of it gets done, I, I'm assuming that this will be spent in the way that it's supposed to be spent, because if not, then it goes back to the federal government. That's what would happen to those funds. It's not like we get to put them in a whole other, you know, account. There are the federal government, from my understanding, it now is trying to claw back monies that have not been um, have not been appropriated um, with diff in different municipalities um, already. And so the whole the whole idea of even having an MOU in the first place is to make sure that these monies uh, in writing are properly appropriated for public works into this particular project, to these particular projects. So uh, um, my assumption regarding when, it, when we talk about, you know, termination, that, that particular clause 
that I don't think that I don't know that those funds, if it's not used in time, I don't know that those funds could be reallocated. I think they would have to be sent back. So lots of hypotheticals here. Yeah, um, lots of hypotheticals. The, as it was originally written in the final rule was December 31st, 2024. Whereas if something were to happen prior to that date, um, it is today theoretically possible that those funds could be reallocated. Um, however, it's kind of, there's been in the news a few times with the potential um, clawbacks as part of the, the debt ceiling negotiations of unspent ARPA funds. Whether or not that option will exist in the future, I don't know. Um, but again, it's a lot of hypotheticals. But um, from a MOU standpoint, um, right, it, it can be, I think, as simple as a sentence that, you know, should this project not occur and, you know, ARPA funds are still available, um, you know, it will be committed to, you you know, following the goals of the concept plan or something very um, similar to that. And, you know, the whole idea is that we never have to go into that scenario anyway. So, um, but, yeah. Mary Alice. So, I guess my confusion is with the... Um, ARPA requirements, so under number one, it says ARPA allocation contingency. So based on what you've talked about, so this is a city uh, project so where there's no, like, uh, ordinance or, sorry, resolution that we allocate the funds so, because this is an internal project. But by putting in there that the contingency of um, adequate grant funds are not received by the executive department, oh, so adequate grant funds from the U.S. Department of Treasury I understand that it's contingent upon that, but it, does that put us at a weird state with the project starting of the 2024? I, I'm trying to figure out the window. If, there, if the federal government's going to claw back money, I'm just trying to make sure that we don't miss the opportunity here. So um, I won't put my lawyer hat on, uh, even though it's a lot of fun. But um, so these, con these agreements uh, were structured um, almost identically to the ones that we've used for CDBG home other ones. So uh, it's a lot of boilerplate language where, you know, maybe CDBG was changed to ARPA. Uh, we did that because we know that's what the U.S. federal government likes to see in an MOU with yourself to count it as allocated. So we have all the ARPA funds in our bank account now. So I think this is probably a section that is unnecessary in many respects because we do have all the money and um, so we know where we have it. Um, but we just used the exact same format as the previous ones to make sure we ticked all the boxes on the federal level if it ever came to it. Okay, so, so it sounds to me like uh, the, the first one is, is not necess necessary, but it's in there because that's how federal paperwork is filled out. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Chandra. Um, uh, what is this PowerPoint? Is this the people that you're going with for the lateral something? The PowerPoint was from the ARPA presentations in December. So what? I'm not, I, I don't recall the top of my head. That was um, whatever was submitted then is was attached now, but I'm not familiar with the specifics. I, it doesn't look familiar. Okay, thank you. I think I heard Tim say it's a case study. Grace. Okay, so if I just loop back around, it sounds like we're gonna add Trend, look into trying to add some language about termination and what happens with, can we do it for both of them, for the sewer lateral and the, the roof repair? Especially just because it seems, you know, like it can be terminated in whole or in part the convenience of either party, um, which, you know, I, we don't expect anything to happen, but I think it would be good to have in writing just to say what that means. This money would be flagged into another pool and reallocated in a process. Yeah, it, it should be pretty straightforward. Um, I don't know if you'll get the, the signed version uh, for next week, but it'll be in the contract. Okay, any upgrades? Go ahead. I had a um, discussion I wanted to bring out about another um, project on the Park District Health and Wellness Center. And I do apologize. I thought I had brought this up in all of our conversations, but I think in all of the many discussions I may not have. Um, so understanding that it's also late in the game for this, but I still do want to bring it up. And I think that there might still be some opportunity to have some spirit of what I'm talking about included. Um, 
definitely understand the upfront payments and avoiding their interest stuff. What I'm trying to get at the spirit of it is whenever possible to prioritize some of their public free amenities. And so I'm not sure also if Will or others, if there's um, others here knowledgeable to speak on it, kind of the status of that plan. Cause what I recall, there's a lot of indoor spaces that will be paid membership. And that they're also looking to construct an outdoor playground, water park, public spaces that would be freely accessible to the public. And my thoughts here that I meant to bring up earlier in this process was if there's a way for them to prioritize some of those free public spaces with particularly our ARPA contribution. Um, to me, that's what I think is a big asset. And I'm worried that depending on how their funding was going, that that was one of the things that might be cut from this project. And so um, I don't know if there's information on the status of the outdoor amenities or if there's a way to, you know, uh, suggest that they prioritize that whenever possible. Mayor. I had a conversation with the director of the park district at the groundbreaking last weekend. The ARPA money that we're allocating, and in fact all the, ARP, all the funding from the various um, state and federal sources go toward construction of the facility itself. The outdoor amenities are not funded at this point. However, they're already beginning the process of applying for additional grants for the outdoor publicly accessible facilities. So all this funding that you have allocated is for the construction of the building and the facility and equipment. Was that, um, I don't recall that being a part of the discussion. Like when they were here presenting, they were talking about the possible outdoor one. I didn't recall that being brought up before that this request was specifically for their indoor facilities. Yes, it was, yeah. And they had to value engineer the outdoor when the costs increased. But there are other grant funds that they're seeking for building the outdoor. There will be additional fundraising efforts and, and um, the social service grants that, um, similar to the social service grants that you approved earlier tonight, in the future there could be applications for social service grants for scholarships for use of that facility as well. So there's opportunities through social service grants as well. Chandra? Yeah. Um, from what I understand, um, they're, they're, they are doing something to um, ensure that the facility is accessible to those folks that live in that neighborhood who are, are typically um, lower income families or in that underserved neighborhood. And so um, if that, I, I definitely expect the park district to, you know, stand by that and, and making sure that, you know, their facility is accessible to all. Um, yeah, I, I, yes, I did see that 10,000 for scholarships. Um, and I hope that they continue to apply every year for that youth services grant so that there is a, a pool of money to offer scholarships for families to use this facility. Um, because otherwise, like, it, it wouldn't have had my support. So I, I, I'm pretty sure that I, I think the Park District will make efforts to um, make sure that it's accessible, <clears throat> as that's the conversation I had with the Park District Director. Mayor, did you want to? No, go ahead, James. James, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say I, I was able to be at the ground breaking is one of the first things I got to do out in the public since I, I got back. But um, I did have a very good conversation with Representative Ammons and one of the park district staff about how we ensure that and expand that question about how the neighborhood is invited in and supported in utilizing the resources that are there. So we, we have a number of people that are interested in keeping an eye on that and asking that it be more than just $10,000 in scholarships in the longer term because um, it ha that community has to be invited in. There can't be a barrier. Even, even you know, forcing people to ask for help to do that is a barrier. And so we have to work, we're gonna have to work on that. Um, I, I do wanna add that uh, I had no question about the fact that what the park district was coming to us for was money to help build the building. 
because the costs had increased due to supply chain, COVID, so forth. I was not looking at this as a basket of items that we were looking at in the project and saying, this is the part we're funding. I looked at it as, this is how we're helping this project come to fruition. Mary Alice, will you take the chair? Sure, the chair recognizes Chris. Thank you. Um, so I had uh, pretty extensive meetings with the Park District uh, executive staff, and I had three requests. I had that the building would be built with minority contractors and women-owned contractors, um, and they promised a 30% level. The second thing I asked for was that uh, the when the building is finished, that the uh, building would be staffed by minorities and women um, as as part of the staff working at the building, um, and they and they promised to do that as well um, to the degree they can. And then the third thing was this uh, making it accessible. And I would just submit, and I think everybody is saying the same thing here, is that it's not entirely on the park district to make sure things are free and accessible for the community in that area because they got to keep the lights on, they got to pay staff, they got to pay for maintenance of that building. So it's going to be up to the rest of the community, including us, that we make funds available for, for that uh, accessibility. And, I'll take the chair back. All right, I relinquish the chair back to Chris. Okay, any other comments? Okay, Madam Chair, I'm going to um, ask, I'm, I'm gonna ask for a motion to do the bundled omnibus resolutions first and then come back to agenda item 21 separately second. Is it, can I do that? Okay, thank you. All right. So I'm going to ask for a motion to approve uh, for the consent uh, ag uh, agenda next week uh, the following resolutions. Uh, resolution number 2023-05-052R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA sub-recipient agreement with the Urbana Park District. Resolution number 2023-05-054R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA sub-recipient agreement with the Cunningham Township. Resolution number 2023-05-055R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA sub-recipient agreement with the Champaign Township. Resolution number 2023-05-056R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of a, an ARPA subrecipient agreement with the Housing Authority of Champaign County Youth Build. Resolution number 2023-05-057R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA subrecipient agreement with the Housing Authority of Champaign County Steer Place. Resolution number 2023-05-058R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA subrecipient agreement, Housing Authority of Champaign County SRO project. Resolution number 2023-05-059R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA subrecipient agreement, University YMCA. Resolution number 2023-05-060R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA subrecipient agreement, Urbana School District 116, Alternative Education. Resolution number 2023-05-061R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA subrecipient agreement, Urbana School District 116, Community Engagement. 
Resolution number 2023-05-062R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA subrecipient agreement, UCIMC. Resolution number 2023-05-063R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA subrecipient agreement with the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers. And finally, resolution number 2023-05-064R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA subrecipient agreement with Justin Peterson. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Mary Alice, seconded by Sharice. Any discussion? Okay, this will be a voice vote again. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. All those resolutions are sent to the consent degree. Uh, uh, consent agenda <laughs> for next week. Okay, and that leaves us with one more motion on uh, agenda item 21. I will move resolution number 2023-05053-R, a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an ARPA subrecipient agreement with the Champaign County Environmental Storage to City Council with a recommendation for approval. Second. Uh, yes, approval, not consent. <laughs> okay. Uh, motion by Mary Allison. I second. James, did you second that? Okay. Uh, seconded by James Quisenberry. Uh, any discussion? Okay, uh, this will be a voice vote again. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. And abstaining from Grace. And Grace Wilkin will, from Ward 6 will be absten uh, abstaining. And the ayes have it, and that resolution passes as well. Okay, we got through it. All right, uh, the next thing is I need a motion for closed session on a property acquisition pursuant to 5 ILCS 120-2, paragraph C and 5. So moved. Second. Okay, All the, uh, I think uh, we'll call a roll call on that, on this? Correct. Uh, so will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Okay. We, point, oh. point of order? Yes. It, it's important to note that there are other items potentially on the agenda after the closed session, so we may return and act. Correct. Uh, good point, James. Uh, there will be uh, more items on the agenda after we come out of closed session, but for now we'll be in closed session. Okay, can I get a motion to adjourn, uh, to uh, reconvene? Motion Aye. to reconvene. Second. Okay, uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Mayor Marlin? Okay, we are back in open session. New business continued. Uh, the next item is ordinance number 2023-05-015, an ordinance authorizing the purchase of certain real estate, namely 1205 Bradley Avenue in Urbana. And we go to Carol to tell the public, or no, I'm sorry, <laughs> Will, <laughs> go ahead. Stuck in there. All right, thank you. So before the council tonight is an ordinance for the purchase of 1205 Bradley Avenue. And this property is a 1.76 acre lot at the southeast corner of Bradley and Goodwin Avenues. The purchase price is 270,000. And we would use this property for the replacement of Fire Station 3 for that new construction project. So going into a little bit of a history, um, a while back, the city completed a facilities master plan that showed Fire Station 3 was in need for replacement. Um, at that time, the master plan speculated a five to 7,000 square foot station size from a very high level vanilla box conceptual level. So in response to that, the city actually pr purchased property adjoining the current station in 2020. 
um, and we purchased that for the flexibility of building a new fire station. So as we were going, undertaking our fire station design and space programming assessment, the budget and associated program that the city council is moving forward with based off direction for city council calls for a station that is 8,489 square feet, which is larger than the facility's master plan speculated. And preliminary design layout for the new station shows that development uh, for the new station on the existing site on Lincoln is technically feasible. However, it creates several logistical and operational issues. Two of these are related to ingress, ingress and egress. The first is that there is shared egress with a commercial property to the north, which is not really safe from a fire perspective. And then additionally, on um, the egress out of the property from the emergency exit, based off the constrained um, site size, uh, there's required parking there where, as the fire trucks are leaving, which is also not safe. Um, the site is also constrained for future expansion based off of zoning setbacks, so in the future we wouldn't be able to expand if that was needed. And then there are also some logistical obstacles that the city faces with maintaining operations during the construction period. So what this means is, um, depending on what the obstacles were, we would have to pay to mitigate to keep the fire station operational. So the city conducted and hosted a survey in a fire station open house on January 11th and community feedback at that time, while limited, did support, uh, generally support the idea of an alternative fire station location. Um, based off some of the operational concerns and that feedback, the city uh, searched for properties and we secured the property at 1205 Bradley Avenue. This site would allow for all the development challenges to be mitigated while moving the station off of Lincoln Avenue, which significantly increases safety. Uh, and it is near enough to the existing site where there's not projected to be any negative impact on response times. Um, so that's the property and the purpose in a real brief synopsis from a fiscal impact. The city has funds available in its capital improvement CRI fund in the fire station project that we could use to purchase this project in the current fiscal year. If approved by city council, the city would close with the seller on a mutually agreed upon date and we would begin work on that ne site work needed for fire station design immediately. James. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm um, some information I got earlier, which is the lot that we purchased that's adjoining the current station was purchased for about $250,000. And so when we are done with building a new fire station, if we buy this lot for $270,000, we'll have that parcel and the old fire station parcel as a value that the city can utilize comparatively to what we're moving the fire station to. Is that is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Grace. I just also wanted to clarify, if you confirm that we don't have set plans, no official plans for the current site, um, but that that would be up for a, another conversation at a later date with what to do with the old sites. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. I will go ahead and make a motion. Um, I'll move ordinance number 2023-05015, an ordinance authorizing the purchase of certain real estate at 1205 Bradley Avenue in Urbana, Illinois, to city council with a recommendation for approval. Second. Any further discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? No. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Quisenberry? Yes. That ordinance passes. Next on item is ordinance number 2023-05-016, an ordinance authorizing the acquisition of certain real estate, namely 131 and 205 North Ray Street. And now Carol can help us. Thank you. Uh, so tonight uh, with this ordinance, uh, we are recommending that the city purchase the former site of the school district 116 headquarters and adult education building uh, in order to advance the purposes of the central TIF. And so um, by way of background, the school district has tried to sell this site uh, twice in recent years. 
um, about a year ago. Uh, the process that they have to use is that they must obtain an appraisal and then they go through an auction process and through the auction they may not accept an offer that is below the appraised uh, value and that is set as a minimum bid. And then if that fails, then they can go out with a commercial broker or go out with a broker. So about a year ago, they went out uh, for an auction with a minimum price of $950,000. That failed. They and, and engaged a commercial broker who then listed the property for $1,150,000, and that failed to generate any offers that were acceptable to the school district. More recently, they went out and had an auction and the minimum bid, they got a new appraisal, the minimum bid was set at $450,000. They did not get an acceptable bid um, that met the minimum, but they did get a, an, a bid at $113,000. We've been in conversation with the school district um, recently in their efforts to, to um, sell the property, and we made them an offer that we would match the offer they were not able to accept through the auction process at $113,000. Um, and, and if they would agree not to go out with a broker again, which we thought was going to be a fruitless process again, and they, and they agreed to accept our offer at $113,000. And so this is before the council first, and then it will go to the school district um, in June if you, um, if you agree um, with this uh, recommendation. So the reason we're so interested in this property is it's along Race Street, which is an important corridor in downtown. It's located in the central TIF. It's not only proximate to the Boneyard Creek, but it's proximate to the Boneyard Creek crossing, which we've invested a lot of money in trying to activate. So this is a real focal point for the downtown. And when we had um, made a proposal to the council, which they pa which you all passed um, about six months ago, I think, where we were porting money from TIF 2 into Central TIF, we anticipated that we would be involved with this property at, at a minimum with the demolition, uh, funding that with TIF. So now we have the opportunity to also acquire the property using TIF funds. And by having city control over this property, we will have um, both the flexibility and the control to, to select the developer, to um, have influence over the development schedule and ultimately over what is um, developed there. I don't think anyone, including the school district at this point, um, would uh, suggest that the building has any value. So we are very trying to be very clear that we do intend to tear the building down. And um, we have built into the contract with the school district the flexibility. They're currently back in the building because of a, of a fire at their um, at their current location uh, that they rent from MTD. And so we're giving them some flexibility to deal with that and, and vacate the building when they're ready and then we'll close shortly thereafter. So I'm happy to answer any questions. James. Yeah, I, thank you. I, I just wanted to confirm something that's implied in the conversation and that is because the city is a public body, the school district is a public body, the way they need to go about this is a little more relaxed than if they're trying to sell it. That's that's sale. correct. Okay, that's thank correct. you. Mm, anybody else? Mm, okay, not, don't see any. Um, can I get a motion? I move ordinance number 2023-05-016, an ordinance authorizing the acquisition of certain real estate, 131 and 205 North Ray Street. Second. Motion by Chandra, seconded by Sharice. Any further discussion, James? Yeah, I, I will I will support this. I think it's important. Uh, this property, as it's been pointed out, is on Ray Street, which is a corridor that could use some uh, more development. I, I, do, I will say that I, I do have a small concern with regard to this property and what kind of uh, asbestos abatement might be involved with uh, demolishing it, but I don't think it's a... It's a, not a concern that would uh, keep me from supporting it. I do know that the, the school district has had challenges keeping their buildings um, managed from an asbestos standpoint. So, but I do intend to support it. Thank you. Grace. Um, 
I'm also in support of this. I think there's some great potential for downtown. Um, I agree with the purchase and then the demolition, if that's what's necessary. And then I think for the decision on the final use or final plans for that, I'll reiterate, I think does need to be a council and public decision. Um, and so I will hope that we will have this brought back up and have some input from the public as uh, we serve them on the final use of that lot. And then I also just recently learned about a city-owned surplus property team, which sounds really exciting, um, and just wanted to make sure that Tim had a highlight um, from some past discussions that there are some individuals, some groups that are interested in green spaces, edible agroforestry, um, putting some of those spots to use. So if we could communicate on that later, I think that could also be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, uh, discussion is over. So uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkin? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Okay, that ordinance passes. That'll be sent to the next uh, council meeting. Our next item is council input and communications. James. I realize this may be a little redundant but because I don't know how many people were watching for the special meeting, but I'll mention again the Southeast Urbana Neighborhood Association is having their annual meeting next week on Wednesday, May 24th from 7 to 9 p.m. at St. Matthew Lutheran Church. I would also uh, like to express my thanks for my welcome back tonight and all of the support I've received while I've been uh, a little bit out of commission for a couple of weeks due to health reasons. I do appreciate it. And I do appreciate everything everybody did to keep me connected during that, that meantime, and I'm glad to be back. Okay, anybody else? Uh, Therese. Um, I just want to um, comment regarding the MOU and um, the the uh, Ellis Drive subdivision relining of the um, of the laterals. So, because I, I want people in my in my uh, in Ellis subdivision to feel uh, secure in the fact that that is going through. It may not happen this year, but there are a lot of things that have to that have to um, happen before um, we actually get work going. Uh, namely, making sure that everyone has signed on to it and has and there's a permission by the city to be on your property. So I want to keep that in mind. I also want to say that in June there will be a meeting uh, at King School for the, um, regarding um, Imagine Urbana, I think it is, and um, I'll be keeping people in in in. Uh, in touch with with that when that meeting starts, so that everyone can people from the area from the L subdivision area and going up through uh, Ward Three will know that um, when to come in when to come and give your opinion about uh, what city uh, services uh, are happening, and you'll know what you want and what what you have suggestions about. That would be nice. Anybody else? Well, seeing no further, uh, I just want to quickly thank uh, the city clerk, Phyllis Clark, and Mayor Marlin for helping me get through this meeting um, and with their advice. And uh, with no other business, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>